Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield with Manny Things, and welcome to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you enjoy this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Things. Without further ado, let's get to this episode. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the podcast where I talk to anyone in the shooting industry. Today's a special one, but first, we'll get to our sponsor. This show is sponsored by Go Fast, Don't Suck. So go over and support Bill. Do that. GoFastDon'tSuck.net. Get your dry fire targets, your cool jerseys, uh, your memes to make fun of yourself and or your friends and share it with them. But anyway, that's Bill. But now today we're getting on to this episode. We are sitting down with Mr. Mike Stoker of Supervel. Mike, how are you doing today, sir? Doing good. Doing good. How are you? Doing fantastic. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to sit down with me. Oh, it's It's been an honor, sir. Heck yeah. <laughs> well, Mike, I know a little bit about you. We chit chat from time to time, um, but maybe someone in the shooting industry doesn't know who you are, which would be kind of insane. But who is Mike Stoker? <laughs> um, well, briefly, I'm competition shooter, um, husband, father, got two kids, uh, kind of an entrepreneur, business person. I'm the president of Super Bowl Ammunition, and I kind of my life revolves around guns, shooting, manufacturing ammunition, and spending time with my family. So that's kind of the, the brief overview of me. <laughs> yeah, and you are a very busy gentleman. Before we were talking, you work a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Mike, um, did you ever think you would land into this space, you know, um, in the gun industry? I mean, I've... The first business I owned was in probably 2011. I started my instructing business when I was 21 years old. So I mm -hmm. got into the gun industry at 21. I earned my, owned my first gun shop at 23 years old. Um, I've been in the industry now for over a decade. Was it my plan like growing up? Absolutely not. I was supposed to be like a doctor if you ask my parents. I mean, that was my initial plan. And I was big into sports, but the shooting industry just kind of came as, Hey, this is a hobby. This is fun. And I've always thought of looking at my family and my siblings of like work, work, work. I'm like, well, if I could do what I enjoy and make money doing it, why don't I do that? So that's kind of where, how it's led to this point where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I honestly think that, you know, doing something you enjoy makes life probably a whole lot more enjoyable than having that nine to five grind of being miserable and hating your job and, <laughs> It can. I've done both. I, I do for many years. I You have to do that nine to five lots of times and do your dream on the side until it becomes a, until it can become a full-time thing. But I did that for plenty of, plenty of years. So I get both sides of that. Oh, I can imagine. Now you said you started getting into the firearms industry about 21, 23 years old. Um, what kind of was that first firearm you had at that time? Um, well, I've been around guns my whole life, grew mm -hmm. up hunting. So, I mean, I, first time I shot a gun, I was about three years old. So my father always, we we're big into hunting. So no, no handguns. My parents wouldn't allow that. I was always hunting rifles, sporting rifles. Um, when I immediately, when I turned 21, I got my CCW, uh, my first handgun. My first handgun was actually a kel <laughs> It was the kel PF9, uh, not by choice, but more as a gift type thing. Um, I didn't get into the shooting sports until I was 28. So 2018 is when I first got introduced to competition shooting. Um, before that, it was more instructing. I went through, I have 12 cert certs with the NRA. I don't use them anymore. But at the time, um, to get with ranges, you got to be NRA certified. So I have 12 NRA certifications. I taught a lot of their stuff for quite a few years and taught like concealed carry and so it was more um, how to use a gun, your rights as a gun owner, how to defend yourself, all the Second Amendment type stuff later became the competition fun. So, Gotcha. Now, going through that, like you were teaching, instructing, um, did you see a lot of students come through those kind of classes or was it hit or miss? Oh, it was a lot. I mean, most the biggest demand was um, uh the concealed carry permit. I mean, mm -hmm. Most it was Sandy Hook happened in 2012. That was a big boom in my business. So 
I, um, from the time I instructed, I still own that business. It's just more, I have an FFL as well attached to that. I retain it. I haven't instructed though in the last two to three years, I've been too busy with other stuff. Um, but in the time that I was full-time doing that, I, every week, I mean, I think if I remember right, it was about just in the Las Vegas Valley, I've certified over 6,000, uh, individuals with their concealed carry permits. Wow. Um, so it was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of instructing. My intention was I love one-on-one education, like private training stuff, but everyone wanted the concealed carry permit. That's where the money was at. I was young, chasing money, uh, got into the you know, approved by Metro, by the police department to teach their curriculum and to instruct and certify people to be able to defend themselves. So. Gotcha. Now, have you always lived in the Nevada area? Not Nevada. Yeah. I was, Las Vegas. Yes. Yeah. I was born. Well, I'm in Henderson, which is like a suburb mm-hmm. of Las Vegas, but yeah, I was, I was born and raised here. So I've oh. lived here my whole life. Ever think about moving away? All the time. <laughs> I, I should have moved by now, but the longer I stay, the more I get rooted and we're finally with COVID and all the riot stuff we had here and everything going on. Finally, the wife's like, all right, I'm ready to go. And I was like, I've been trying to leave for 10 years, but now it's a little bit more difficult. So we consider it, um, but businesses, everything's kind of here. Both my entire family and her whole entire family's here. We're all within like a mile of each other. So um, there's a lot holding us here. I travel a lot away from here. I spend a lot of time in Utah, Arizona, even California, but mm-hmm. yeah. Now, not trying to get too much into your personal life. If you could move anywhere in the United States, where would you go? Um, I'd probably go, I'd probably move to Utah. I'll end up in Utah just because I can be there. There's really good shooting in Southern Utah. I can do my businesses there. Um, I can still come back and see my family here. And it's a free state. Um, it's not, Nevada has pretty much become California. Everyone says Texas, but it's a lot of people from Cal even moving there. Utah is growing quickly, but it's still um, a little bit more free in my opinion. And it suits the things that we're into and it's close to family. So that's probably where I would end up. Good answer. Go on. Yeah, it sounds. It looks like a good place, especially with all the all the competitive shooters down at Sups and all that. Yeah, that's two like... two hours away for me now. So St. George is good. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Mike, have you taken any formal um, either defensive training or competition um, focused training? Yeah, I've done both. As of late, like on the competition side, um, when I first started shooting, I was like, oh, I can just do this myself that was wrong. I wish I had started, I wish I had done training in the beginning. Um, but the most like recent formal training would probably be with JJ. I've taken his class. I was fortunate when he lived here in Vegas, I got to train with him, you know, weekly and spent a lot of time with him. And he kind of mentored me for a while. He still does from a distance, but, um, yeah, I would like to do more training and, you know, I haven't gotten to have been Stager class. I'd love to get into one of those and, Um, There's other great like Mason Lane and there's a lot of great instructors. It's just, you know, finding the time to do that. I travel a lot, compete a lot. And then with business as well, time's limited, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, yeah, you're always at the range and I bet, I I bet you could host a class, but yeah, that time aspect is very hard to nail down too. So. Oh yeah. I could have one of them come in. It's just the time and the seriousness of the shooters here in our Valley trying to get the commitment and, We'll see. Mm-hmm. Now, um, we all know that everyone is secretly a gear queer when it comes to stuff. So for all, to, to satisfy those people, you want to go ahead and share kind of like what gun and gear you're using in um, competition? Uh, yeah, right now I'm kind of up in the air. So um, I'm balancing in a couple divisions right now. It's like the off season. I have a major in less than a month, so. I'm still deciding if I'm going to shoot limited or carry optics in it. Um, But as far as my belt setup goes, it's the same products. Mm -hmm. It's just different divisions. So uh, I I use the dominant defense belt in both divisions. I use the double alpha, the alpha X, the metal carriers um, in both divisions. I use a priority one holster 
and both. And then I use the boss drop hanger. Um, as far as my pistol and carry optics, I've been shooting the uh, SIG 320 Max. I really like that gun. I'm brand new to dots this year. So that's been an interesting journey. I can see where it's helping me a lot with my iron sight, especially on the visual aspect. Um, going back to limited, I'm still up in the air about it. Mm -hmm. I definitely a dot favors me as far as placement with like local GMs and top shooters that I've gone against. Um, I easily put like 8% on myself, my limited to my CO, um, which I'm hoping that'll bring up my limited because of some of the takeaways I've got from it. So I enjoy carry optics a lot, but it might just be the greener pasture type thing because I've been so long in iron sights. Mm -hmm. um, but for my limited setup, I shoot the Atlas Gunworks Artemis. Um, right now I have the Nemesis and the Titan and I have all the Atlas pistols, but my main, uh, for last year's season was the Artemis and I'll probably, that one seems to fit me the best, um, for my grip and everything and style. So I'll probably continue with that one this year if I shoot limited. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can always ammo, go back. Obviously is... <laughs> go ahead. No, go right ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was saying ammo is obviously super well. <laughs> of course, you're gonna. No, I'm gonna shoot someone else's ammo, right? You're like, <laughs> no, no. You load your, you load your own, don't you? Still though, at super well, or do you have someone else to load your ammo? I did. Yeah, I loaded most of my own in 2020. I did 2021. Halfway through, I finally said screw it and spent the hundred grand on the machine that does it for me. Um, yeah. And a lot of people like on that 40 load, um, people are like, well, how good is this? How test is this? And I have personally on that load put about 140,000 rounds of that exact load before it ever went to market. So that's a big thing with Super Bell is like, we've got like, how many GM shooters do we have? Most of the guys running our machinery are either master class or grandmaster shooters. And they're some of the top shooters. Mm -hmm. And we all obsess like on the quality and everything. So it's, um, before the, you'll see us release a product that's been tested and pushed through the paces. And so, yeah, once, once things got really busy, I quit, um, I quit doing it myself and now other people do. I still QC it though. I don't, I don't let anybody touch my stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, at least you got your hands on the cookie jar being like, hey, at least I checked it before it went in my gun. Yeah. And I, we never have problems. Not that I don't trust my guys. It's more of a sense of like, I want the customer first. And so like anytime they're spending on touching my ammo or their ammo, it's like taken away from customers. So usually like most of the shop guys, like for their ammo, we'll end up on our free time getting that done and QCing it. That way we don't take away from the customer. Gotcha. Now, Oh, what was, Oh, I mean, you could always go back to single stack though. Right. I mean, you still got that pistol. Yeah. You, you go play in the boomers. I still have those. I've thought about it. I, I sometimes miss single stack. I spent two years there. I wish I wouldn't beat it, beat the dead horse so bad because like I was done with it. And then I stayed in it for like eight more months because they pushed nationals back in 2020. Mm -hmm. So I, not eight months, whatever, six months I stayed in it and I should have just been done then. And I wasn't. And so kind of that division sucks. Like it's, I mean, part of it's are fun, but it's not high cap is so much more fun. And I kind of, I don't know. I'll, I'll shoot. I still have all the gear and all the guns and everything. And eventually I'll play with it just that more as fun and less obsessive, I guess. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you did get to shoot nationals with AJ Zito. That was always cool. Him and his long ass yeah. beard. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That, I, I, I feel bad for you getting, what was that? That was 2020, 20, 2020 nationals. You got DQ'd, correct? Yeah. 20, yeah. 2020 nationals. Yeah, that was a shit call, but <laughs> it's what it, that was kind of the icing on the cake. I mm -hmm. should have, because my whole goal with single stack, a lot of people realize, like, I'm the type of dude that I love the challenge and something that sucks. And I saw where single stack would hone a lot of my fundamentals and in the shooting side of things. So I, my whole goal was always limited. And I like forced myself in that division, division. And I told, like, made a rule, like, I'm not leaving this division until I make GM. And I wanted to GM match bump at nationals. And I went to, cause I was thinking of shooting limited 10 and single stack and I didn't have a classification limit 10. So I went to a super classifier locally and I was like, Oh, I'm going to shoot, get my L 10 class. 
I'm just gonna use my single stack gun. And I was like, well, I might as well shoot my shoot it in single stack. So I'll just shoot two divisions, whatever. Not even thinking about it, just messing around trying to get. I ended up G, getting my GM card. And I had four 100s. I was like, why did I just do that? So, so then I go to nationals and DQ, and I'm like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> like I'm out of here. Let's go play in limited. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, because everyone wants to race in the 40 cal game. I shot 40 in single stack. I had the same load. Nothing changed. The gun feels very similar. So it was an easy, like for me to bounce my single stack gun to my my, uh, double stack 1911, my Artemis, it's like, or my Titan, either one. It's pretty easy to change over for me. Mm -hmm. Same load, same recoil impulse. I've got them tuned extremely similar, so. Yeah. Did you ever think about trying going a uh, 40 cal minor ammo for a uh, single stack? I had the load. I did. It just depend on the match. So mm-hmm. I had like, the, that's the reason I went with 40. Um, I would run the trip, the 10 round mags. So when I shot major, obviously you're only putting eight in them. And then I had a, a load specifically. So like I would go to matches, look at the stages and say, Hey, is this favor major or minor and register that way. And nine times, Times out of ten, I always shot my uh, shot it in major though. Mm-hmm. I wanted those points. Lately now though, you'll see the insurgent like the last year, how many more shooters are shooting minor just due to the stage design on a national level and at not nationals, mainly area matches favor the high capacity. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely, and it'd be interesting to see someone like Nils almost winning limited nationals with a minor gun. Yeah, yeah, it, it's crazy. Yep, capacity does a lot, but at the end of the day, it's the shooter and the points, and mm-hmm. points are points. So, absolutely. Now, um, you're talking a little bit about your off season. You're shooting carry optics a little bit, you know, training with limited still. Um, what kind of made you go and want to push out and go into carry optics a little bit? I was burnt out on limited. I um, the biggest struggle on this is kind of like a little bit with JJ was helping me and he'd come down and we trained a couple times. He's coming and teaching classes and transitions are always a big thing, but visual speed. And I have, I have great vision, but like the perception change. And I was kind of old school of, you know, sight focus, like eyes to the target and then transition where your focal plane is. And I realized as my, like as a, from a C class, D class, B class, A class, a skill set progressed, in the lower class, you know, I needed to be transitioning my focal plane from target to sites for perfect alignment and stuff. But as you hit like a master class to grand master level, your natural indexing, your natural point of aim, your skill set is so concreted um, and your confidence should be there to where your where you can spend more time on target focus really changes. The problem was I wasn't changing with the skill set. So it was more of a trust thing. So I, I almost and due to his advice too. He's like, you need to shoot a dot, like, cause it's going to force you to focus. I found myself over, it look would appear as over aiming as an I'm on the target, but it was the, and should have been shooting, but it was the time my eyes were coming from target to sites. And so it's like, I started adding that up and looking at it and how much lost time. And I spent a while training on my iron sights to target focus as much as I can, but it, I was just struggling with it. So going to a dot, um, 100% like if you look at your dot as in your focal plane you're doing it wrong you should be focusing on the target and superimposing the dot nice and crisp so acknowledging the dot but not staring at the dot um, so I literally I shot area two which was horrible after nationals I should have switched but we sponsored area two so I go shoot it didn't care wasn't in it shot limited and as soon as I was done like that gun it just came out yesterday so my limited gun from November has stayed in its case, didn't even get clean, got put in a safe. <laughs> and I've been shooting carry optics the whole time just to like force myself um, into doing that visual change at that, not at the upper level, but shooting with the upper level guys and training and talking to them like this, that next level of speed, I was losing a lot with vision. And so that's, it's kind of my reason for doing the carry optics thing. And when you shoot 40 cal for three, four years straight, like you just get tired of it. Nine mil is like 
felt like cheating, like shooting a nine minor gun, even though it's a plastic gun, like it doesn't move. Like it's a dot is easy. I lost a lot. Of, this sounds mean, but I lost a lot of respect for a lot of dot shooters. I'd never shot a dot. Um, and once I shot it within like the second match, I high overalled against like 95 shooters. So I'm like, okay, like this is, I, I would say this is cheating, but this is like a different game. But that was good because it showed me how much time I was losing transitioning my vision instead of just being confident shooting. So I'm excited this year to see what limited. I have a match, a major. Uh, it's uh, the Roadrunner shootout in California. Last year, I was second overall in the division, which made me really mad and limited. So this year, we've got a couple guys in our shop, GM, carry optic shooters. So there's no point for us to have all of us in the same division. So I'll probably shoot it limited. I'm excited for that to see what I can take from carry optics <laughs> to it. Right now, it's an it, it's nice to hear you say all those things about trying to you know quit your with your stop trying to get burnt out, change it up a little bit, explore with the dot for your focal vision and depth. Why carry optics and not open? Because open's stupid. <gasps> you just heard like half of the open shooters in the world. Okay, like, give and half of them give them an iron sight pistol and watch them be C class shooters. <laughs> like that's the reality. It's to me, open division. And this comes from someone who's sponsored by Atlas for four years. Like open division is a pure out top level race division. Um, I don't gr agree with most of the nine major stuff. I didn't want to mess with 38 super comp and to get into the division. I mean, you're, you have to have two guns minimum. Um, your, your ammunition, your, a lot more money in that. And it's not a money thing for me, but I knew that I wasn't going to stay in the division. So like carry optics, I'm like, okay, what's the simplest, easiest. I can get the gun. I have the ammo accessible, I, like no frills, something I don't care about. And I can just get the concept of using a dot and competing with a dot. And to me, open is like a whole new setup, um, all new gear, you know, $16,000 in guns. If you're going to do it right plus loading either nine major 38 super comp sourcing those components. And I'm ammunition manufacturer <laughs> saying that stuff. So it kind of um, avoid it for that. And honestly, I, I had fear of if I shot open, I, I might not go back to, to limited. Um, I don't know. It just wasn't time. I was, I was hoping there's been a lot of power factor talk in the open division with USPSA. I'm hoping some of whatever goes on with that happens. Um, at the time Atlas hadn't released the 2.0 and there was just, there was a lot of variables to me. It, it wasn't for the little time I was going to spend. It wasn't worth it to me. Gotcha. Makes sense. And I know a lot of people are like, you know, they love open and you like 2011. So it was just kind of shocking. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's the 320 fills. I mean, I've got my gun, like I did the grip module to where it's, I can pick up my 320 and then pick up my atlas and have no loss in angle or anything so that one to me like i had glocks and czs and tank bows and everything else but i picked that cz because it felt the natural for my point of aim to match what i shoot but yeah open maybe someday um but it just for the time being it really it really doesn't make didn't make sense for me not to knock all the open shooters sorry if i hurt anyone's feelings but that's we're kinda... sorry trevor not really <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. I tell Trevor that he knows that. I tell him that all the time. <laughs> Trevor should go back to shoot. He should go back to shooting limited. Well, well he beat him because he's beat he him with a limited. minor gun, and he'll go back to limited, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, you, you could just take his wife's money in a bet. So, I mean, ooh. he's shooting. He should be shooting a new 2.0 this year. He shot it at nationals, so I'm mm -hmm. excited to see what what he. Uh, we'll see what he does with it. There's yeah. a, and that's their thing, like like the Atlas team, um, they've got a lot of open shooters. So like with me, when I left single stack, they quit making single stacks and I shot another season with it. And then they're like, well, what, what gun are you going to shoot next year? And in limited, they have, you know, Charlie Perez, they have Cody Axon, two top GMs. And then like, it's all a bunch of open shooters. I'm like, well, I don't really want to go over there and open. That doesn't do anything like let me try it. Let me shoot limited. So that's kind of what kept me out of open too, is it was oversat, not oversaturated, but we needed some guys repping the limited guns as well. So I was like, I oh, will stick with the iron sights, less headache and don't have to deal with all that ammo stuff. 
Yeah, there was a there is a lot of open Atlas shooters. That's for I sure. get it. It's fun. It's mm-hmm. fun, and when I mean, yeah, they this year I don't know how many limited shooters they have this year. How many top ones? But I mean, they I think Chase is still going to shoot. He kind of plays in both. I think open and limited, but I think mm-hmm. his primary focus is limited. And then Charlie and Cody, and I don't know if they've added anyone else, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now I want to go back a little bit. You said you were using the dominate belt. I, I'd like some feedback on that. I'm a, Jason, the owner is a buddy of mine. And what are your, what are your thoughts on that belt? I like it a lot. My wife got it for me for Christmas. Um, I like the rigidity of it. I screwed up that she got the wrong size inner belt. So I need to order a, a bigger one cause I'm too fat for that thing. But I still put the outer belt over. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's my biggest thing. Like when you're, carrying you know 52 ounce gun empty now you load it and then you got you know three mags 140 mil mags on you it's a lot of weight and when you're running i mean the a normal not to knock on other companies but there's other belts that they flex your mags move and Mm -hmm. even on the draw like the movement they'll cause wiggle so that was my biggest takeaway is how well this how sturdy and rigid it was um the quality of stitching and i mean i've only obviously i haven't had it for that long but i immediately comparing it to other uh, ratchet style belts that i was using mm-hmm. i find it superior so i need to yeah i'll recommend that one i'm kind of everyone's a gear whore but i just like what works <laughs> like i yeah. just and that one that's been my feedback and I've, i i should have got it a lot sooner when it first came out i I should have got one, but I got it now. So mm-hmm. sorry to put you on the spot about that, but I, you, you're, oh, no. you, you like stuff like that. So I was like, I just wanted your opinion. And I know that, oh, random phone calls. Um, but, uh, I, I know my buddy Jason likes the feedback, so that's always a good thing. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great product. Um, I need, yeah, I, I enjoyed a lot. We'll see how this season, I mean, until I put like a full season on it mm-hmm. and actual training, like I'm, going to start ramping my training up tomorrow actually is my first live fire session of the year. So I'm, I'm going to start beating the hell out of it. Like I do, I'm notorious for breaking everything. That's why everything's metal. (laughs) So (laughs) we'll see how it should hold up. Just looking at it structurally, it's superior to any other belt I've had. So I don't see there being a problem. Typically with those, the ratchets are what go, but I mean, it seems good quality. So we're going to, we're going to find out. Right. And I, and I know if, if something does ever happen, Jason will make it right for you. So, so, but, um, great segue talking about your, um, going to start live firing tomorrow. What typically is your regular training schedule? Like depends on the time of the year. Um, depends where I'm at in life, honestly. So if you want to go back, like my journey from C class to GM in 13 months, that was firing, you know, a couple thousand rounds a month, dry firing seven days a week, obsess, obsess, but which led to burnout. Um, I, this was, so I started competing in 2018, early 2018. And I, um, I went, you know, all in on it. My first year I shot over 50 matches average. I'll shoot 10 to 15 majors a year. Um, but with, when you make business, mix business with leisure, um, it kind of puts a mental toll on stress. And I, I did not realize that until the end of after nationals this year, we can go a little bit in that and then I'll tell that'll, it'll segue to why the training is going to be what it's going to be and why it's been and why I took a break for the last few months. Um, being the president of super Bowl ammunition and sponsoring matches and, you know, in the last two years, just in our 147 competition load, I've sold over 20 million rounds. So I don't go to a match where I, there's not someone shooting my ammo. And it's really, I didn't realize how much shooting was a stress relief for me because I've always owned businesses and done businesses in other areas and business consulting. So when I would go to the range, I didn't see people that were involved in business. I went to the range just like someone goes to golf. Um, And last year with the sponsorships with Atlas and all the companies being sponsored by, you know, that adds some pressure. But then with my own businesses creeping into the sport, it like really took the fun out of it for me. And I finally like hit a wall to where I was like, all right, I almost didn't shoot nationals. I legitimately, aside from tearing my shoulder, 
don't know if you saw me fall through a wall the week before nationals. Mm -hmm. So I almost didn't shoot it because two days before I couldn't raise my arm. And I go to nationals and shot the whole match with my support hand doing all the work um, to hold the gun up and grip the gun. And this was just pulling a trigger while it was numb. So that kind of sucked. And once we got through that, my obligation with Superbell, the matches we sponsor, I'm going to be there. So that was area two. And then after that, I was like, I'm done. Like I need to, I need to step away. Um, I so busy with work. So like this year, I mean, I have zero sponsorships. I didn't resign with Atlas and it's nothing against them. I mean, we're me and Adam are great friends. Me and Morgan are great friends. Me and the team, we all still chalk talk. We're all in the chat. It was more of a, I have to focus on prioritizing myself and my businesses. Um, and I didn't want it to be a point where I, um, I didn't give them my full. And that's one thing I wish more shooters would do. I see so many sponsored shooters that they just half-ass. They just want a sponsorship and free shit. And I'm not the type, like if I sign a contract and commit, I'm all in. And I knew that it wasn't fair to myself and my company and my employees and my family. I can't be all in on this many things. So I took a break. Um, typically my training. So the way, I kind of do like JJ's three phase thing, phase one, two, and three. And I do a workup as majors approach um, into phase three. So years past um, when it hits the major match season, I'll typically shoot two majors a month starting in March all the way through November. And basically what I do is I, um, I try to live fire practice twice a week shoot at least one to two matches every weekend and I dry fire at least five days a week. So that's normal, but you can see how that gets burnt out. <laughs> um, most of the time because of the business I do, I'm at a gun range firing gun almost every day anyways. So it, it really meshes. So this year um, that, that plan worked really good with rapid skill development, but it didn't work well with balance. Um, now that my skill set is more set, when I, I used to be, if I put a gun down for more than a week, I, I was like relearning. Now I can pick it up and wipe the rust off in one session and be back to where I was performance wise. So uh, moving forward, I'll get back into the, to the aggressiveness, but I just won't do it as extensive. I'll mainly do it leading up to the, to the major matches I care about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I try and touch my gun every day and I try and dry fire as I'm prepping in season. I try to dry fire at least five days a week could be 15 minutes could be an hour it's based on feel for me i don't like to force anything or negative imprint anything um and then live fire could be as simple as static group shooting to full-blown field courses so it's just really based on where i'm at with stuff and it seems to work i mean it's worked for me over the last couple of years so i've learned the kind of the map to help me be successful per se mm -hmm. i know that's kind of broad <laughs> if you want to touch on any of those things i know that was a bit verbal vomit no it's all good no and i think most all those companies respect you for backing away and taking the time everything else deserves like your businesses your your life yeah your family. well it's prior it's priorities i mean it mm -hmm. purely comes to time and priorities mm -hmm. and me as an individual like as personal success and family grows and things grow you have to value what what's your time worth whether it's a money thing, like who's paying, who's not, or it's a relationship thing, who's worth the time. Um, I do. And you, if you listen to other on podcasts, I've said this, like every two years I do a cleanse where I literally stop and I write it out on a whiteboard of what I'm involved in, what is beneficial to both parties, me and that party. And if I, it's not a win-win, I get rid of it. There's that. And then I look at what causes stress um, what is necessary and not necessary. And then I just reevaluate my commitments. So this was that time. And I literally wiped all commitment because one, I don't, I don't need sponsors. I don't need the stress. I don't need the drama. I don't need, not that any more drama, but this, the added, mm -hmm. um, but I can still like with Atlas, I can still, I still talk to them almost daily. I still help them with business. We have a great business relationship with the guns and the ammo and, so all that's still there. It's just, I won't ever commit to something I can't give it a hundred to, and it wasn't fair to them or to me or to any other company. So I finally was like, all right, well, I'll be happier and they'll probably be better off if I just kind of do my own thing and wear a t-shirt, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and there's nothing wrong with wearing just a t-shirt unless it's hot in no. the Nevada sun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll probably might do like a super bell Jersey type thing, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. It's a change of pace. That's all it is. Exactly. And changes of pace are good. I mean, no, I, I think everyone hates coming up and realizing that they're burnt out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it goes in waves. And unfortunately on the shooting thing, I think for me, the effect it had on it is when it became not fun and when it became business and to honestly, I know you, not a politics thing, but a USPSA politics thing, like what really kind of did me was all the BS with the Foley and with the board and with all that drama. I'm like, why am I, I can calculate how much every minute of my life costs based on what I do in business. And I'm like, I'm spending this much time. And every year I look at how much time and money and effort I put into it. And then I look at the board of directors and all the crap going on. I'm like, why am what is this? Like, like what, what is going on? Like, why am I, my wife's been saying it the whole time, but I'm like, okay, is this really worth my effort and time right now to dedicate to that? So that led a lot to the break. It's like the organization is not going to commit to the member. Why should I commit to the organization? Why should I commit to the, the sport on that level? And mm-hmm. now it's just like, Hey, I'm just going to treat it like a fun thing. Like I'll shoot when I want to shoot, whether I win or not, I don't really care anymore. And we'll just try to have fun. So that, that led to the break a lot of it too, but Mm-hmm. we'll see things have continually changed but <laughs> right so so for all you listening mike's not gonna sell his guns anytime soon though i mean maybe no. in a couple of years you never know no i i don't sell like it's weird people ask me that they're like well you know how many outlets i own all my guns and i've never that's one thing about me like i've never i've purchased and i own everything um and i don't need all those atlases but I have them and I have no intention of selling them because I might be like, Hey, I want to shoot single stack today. Or, Hey, I want to shoot limited today. Or, Hey, I want to, you know, so someone would have to pay a lot. And because I have some of like the OG guns, like the first offs and stuff. So it's kind of like, yeah, I'm holding on to those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I had Adam Maxwell on, um, he, he has some of those transitional guns that became yeah. certain brands. It's like, you ain't never getting rid of that thing, even though oh, it's yeah. like, no one wants it, but ever, I think you don't, you ain't getting has, rid- he has like, I think the first transition to like the Erebus. I want to say mm-hmm. he has a couple, but so Adam's like an OG Atlas guy too. Like he's been, whether he's directly with them or not or whatever, like he's a dude that's been with Atlas for so many years and he's got some, he's got some cool guns and that's, what's cool about Atlas is like the growth, so rapidly and you can see the evolution year after year after year it's constantly changing so there's some really cool guns that like guys can't get that Mm -hmm. like i have the very first working prototype of the nemesis so now like the nemesis became like the most popular lemon gun i have like number one like the very ever first working prototype and i shot it they're like oh what are you gonna do with this i'm like i'm gonna shoot it like i shot it for half a season i'm like i don't care it's not gonna be a safe queen but like i'll probably never sell that gun unless i sell it back to adam Mm-hmm. So, yeah that's fun yeah it is and it's it's awesome to see companies innovation like that and it's cool to see that they're one of the top dogs in uh custom 2011s um but i want to talk a little bit more about supervel currently um you have a lot of high class shooters inside your facility and a lot of them who, who run a lot your of ammo. sleepers a lot oh, of yeah. sleepers that this year are going to shake some things up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but uh, Marco's not a sleeper. He's a savage. I know. Not, I'm not talking just about Marco. I mean, there's some other ones that are in the carry optics division this year. We'll see uh, some good stuff. And in limited. Some mm-hmm. stuff's definitely coming. We have uh, quite a few, obviously, that work for us. And then obviously that we sponsor as well. Max Lee Grandis, we got national titles, one with our ammo and some top, top shooters across the board. So mm-hmm. I feel we set ourselves apart from a lot of our competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, very rarely are you going to see, you know, the president of a company out competing as frequently like ammo companies and using their products and there for the feedback and talking to the customers. Mm-hmm. Plus everyone in the facility competes. So, I mean, that's a lot of guys at matches testing our products, but also there for the shooters, if there was ever an issue. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You've got, you've got a lot of good shooters under your belt and supporting the brand, which is awesome. Um, 
like you even sp- super Valley even sponsored a special level one we had over in um indiana the northern uh, indiana classic we had back in october it was awesome yeah, to see i try some- and I handle all the sponsorship and marketing stuff too. So I try, I try to give back to the sport as much as I can. And I love um, not to go back on this political USPSA thing, but I will sponsor as many, um, I want to say section, but like think of like dragon's cup or like mm-hmm. the infinity open this year or road runner or top gun, like those matches, I'll do those all day over an area match or a nationals as a sponsor. Um, yeah so yeah like stuff like that we sponsor a lot this year i think we're sponsoring at least 35 matches um and i shoot them and typically if we're sponsoring it i'm at it or one of my staff is at the match Mm -hmm. Um, so we like to get we like to get involved and give back as much as we can Mm -hmm. and i know when we had that matched up here you sent ammo like you shipped ammo and ammo was hard to come by i mean we were all shooting but it was like it's like people got random prize bags and it's like, Hey, super Vell's here. We got some super Vell ammo. I was like, shit, motherfucker. Give me that bag. I want that. Yeah. No, that's the thing. I treat, I treat that like a flex, like mm-hmm. dragon's cup. Dragon's cup last year was like probably the peak, like bad, bad ammo time. I think it was May of last mm-hmm. year and it was a struggle. And I, I sent, I gave 30,000 rounds to that match. So we were the title sponsor with that list. And I said, here's 30,000 rounds. I provided all the staff their ammo to shoot the match because there's a problem with staff that they had, they, you know, staff, they'll come work the match, but they want to shoot it too. Well, if they can't get ammo. So I provided the staff ammo. I provided ammo for the prize. We provided all the ammo for the demo bay. And I just feel like to me, that's like a big thing because we're competitors and we want to put it out there. And that's typically what we do. We don't just throw like swag and gear any major we sponsor, there's always going to be a lot of ammo as much as we can spare at the time. Mm-hmm. Now you said you handle all the sponsor sponsorships and matches and whatnot. What, if someone's hosting a match and they want, would like to reach out to Supervel, what's a good uh, way for them to get a hold of you about that? They just email me, just Mike at supervelammunition.com. And I get, I get a lot of those. I mean, we're pretty much for, for this year, 2022, um, I just got three more in my inbox yesterday for, for matches. And I don't want to say we're capped, but we're getting close. I mean, the way my marketing budget works, I mean, it's kind of tied together with match sponsors and shooters and the number of shooters we've added on and that we're sponsoring and the needs that they have. I don't want to half-ass anything. Um, so I'm very selective. Also, I, as a business, we vote with our money. You'll mm-hmm. hear the USPSA, hey, vote with your feet. I've been vo- very vocal. And so as partners in business against a lot of the USPSA stuff. So you will see me not sponsor certain things on purpose and sponsor certain matches. Like I'm only going to sponsor the solid matches, the best matches, where they have great staff and they do it right. That's what you're going to see happen. So I reject them and I, you know, I look for oddball specialty stuff because they do it right and they have good stages and they have a good match and I get to be picky (laughs) in that sense, but yes, Mm -hmm. it's fun. There's, there's nothing wrong with being picky because we don't have to put out for everybody. Right. (laughs) No, but yeah, if anyone, I mean, if you're hosting a level two or above, or I like to do a lot of things for the youth, like the, like the infinity experience or like stuff like that, like any youth types shooting stuff. Um, we're open for providing ammo with that any educational stuff i mean the best you can i mean shoot me an email what's the worst i can do is say no Mm -hmm. and if i do there's probably a reason and i'll tell you why so right exactly all you can do is get told no guys i asked mike to come on the show and you know what he didn't tell me no but it's okay if he told me no it would have been okay (laughs) yeah i've told the others no but when you you just hit me at the perfect time i was like yeah you know what all right cool Let's do that. <laughs> and I mean, I've listened to you, Mike, talk on shows that, you know, podcast, some podcasts just aren't worth your time. And it, it's very humbling and honor that you said yes. So I, it always makes my day. So there you go. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking a little bit about Soberville sponsorships. You know, you've always got the soup, the competitive shooter or somebody who's like, I want, I want a sponsor. You know, that all they want is like sponsorships, you know, just so they can have all the, you know, cool jerseys and whatnot. And, you know, and they're just wanting it for them. Um, 
you as a business owner and as a shooter, what would you say to those people who are asking for all that crap, but what do they need to hear? Well, having been on both sides of it as a sponsored shooter, and there's, and there's multiple levels of like individual values. So it's like, what is your value? So some people, I mean, I sponsor some shooters that are amazing shooters. They don't do social media. They're not, but they're going to podium or they're going to win every time. Mm -hmm. So they have that value. And then there's another individual who might like, I sponsor people that aren't even sponsored shooters. They might be tactical type people. They may be instructors who do a lot of instructors, like, or they might be an influencer. They're not the best shooter, but they have a huge reach and they bring a lot of value and education and they're good people. So there's the whole thing is the word I keep saying is like value. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there's a misconception based on some sponsor shooters and maybe myself in the past, like they see us with the Jersey, with the gear, with the swag, the, the guns, the ammo and everything. They're like, Oh, I aspire to be that. I mean, you get it in our sport to the point where there's so many shooters, I would say 80 people, 80% of the people wearing jerseys aren't actually contractually sponsored by those people on their jerseys whether they're wearing it to be a poser or they're wearing it just to rep that brand, which I respect the rep, the brand type thing. Like, Hey, these are the companies that I love. And I, so I'm going to wear this Jersey with their logo, with their permission. I'm all cool for that. Um, but it's not, it's what I can tell people wanting to be sponsored is don't go on it for like, what can I get out of it? If you want to be a successful, desirable shooters for sponsors for company is like, what can I give? How can I make a win-win for the company and for myself? So understanding marketing and understanding your value. If you're not a top podium shooter, if you're not winning, you know, area matches, state matches, placing at nationals, if you're not doing those things, then you need to be doing something. Um, whether you're just a great ambassador and you have a lot of engagement and reach to talk about product and you're a good person, or maybe you're, like an influencer type with reach in that sense, like there has to be value somewhere. So it sucks because the shooting community is really small and me being young and in, in shooting and shooting matches, I get asked this in person, like every time, like, Hey, why won't you sponsor me? And initially I would kind of brush things off, but now I've got to the point, like it's, if no one's going to tell them, I'm just going to have to tell them. And I get emails all the time of individuals wanting sponsors. And it, it's hard to be like, well, what is your worth to me? Like you want free ammo or you want a discount on ammo. Well, what does the business get in return? So that's how I was successful with all the companies that sponsored me is my background is business and sales and marketing. And so my value for them is every single one of them had a massive win over like big time win, win and made a lot of them, a lot of money, even if I didn't ask or get it in return. But that was my thing is like, I want to, use the products, the products I'm going to use anyways, I'm going to work with companies I use. So the big turnoffs for me are people that reach out that have never even tried my product or used it and just want a sponsorship. That's an immediate no. Like if you reach out and if you've never even shot our ammo, I'm not going to sponsor you. Mm -hmm. The ones that I take on are people that have shot it, that have used it, that really like it, that are repping it because it's what they truly believe in. Like that's who I want to work with. Um, and that's who we want to, who we want to sponsor. So I get that it's an expensive sport and some people out of desperation to be able to compete on a high level, they feel like they need to land these sponsorships. But if you want to retain, you'll see the guys with every year, they have a different logo on their jerseys. They're not doing their job on, on retention and they're getting booted from the companies because they're not holding up their end of that contract and they're into that bargain. So as an individual wanting a sponsor shooter, you should be approaching based approaching that company with the resume, who you are, what you've done, what your values are, and what you can bring to the table for that company. That's how you get a company to take a chance on you because that's what it is. Your representation, your extension of their brand, you have to represent them properly. You, better yet, you're a liability to their brand. How you behave on the range, how you interact with staff, how you interact with other shooters. Uh, most shooters don't think about that, but as business owners, we absolutely do because we don't want to hear it. I don't want to get the call from someone complaining about one of my shooters. And I have not because I select them appropriately. Um, so those are the main considerations. If you're an individual wanting to sponsor with us, my company or any company is if you take that approach of what's my true value, what's the reality check of like who I am and what I provide. I'm not in this just to get a discount code or free ammo guns or gear. 
I want to grow with a brand and help them grow and they will in turn help. That's the big thing. Like if you are openly about helping their business grow, they're going to grow you way faster because they most likely have much more reach, much more engagement. So it's, it'll be a beneficial win-win, but I don't know if that answers the question, <laughs> but that's kind of how I, I look at it as if I was going after a sponsor and that, that's how I look at it when approached by people is what's your value. Mm-hmm. Oh, and a great way to put it. It's and honestly, people need to look at it that way instead of what can the company give to me? What can I give back to the company and how can we make this more of a partnership <laughs> instead of a given a t- you know? Yeah. And the way I structure um, 99% of the contracts that I had as a sponsor shooter, but also that I do with my shooters is, they're not rewarded. There's no reward happening unevenly. Mm-hmm. So like I can analytically data track everything they're doing through their social media, through their sales, if they're a sales based through everything. So it's like, if you want a reward, whether it be free ammo or whatever it may be, it has to be a win on both sides. No one just gets free shit. So some shooters it's based on like top level podium shooters. It's based on them podium. It's based on them competing and shooting X number of matches and having a presence out there. And that's going to land them that ammo, you know, an influencer ambassador type. Some of them are, might be based on sales. Some of them like instructors and trainers might be based on events, might be based on promotion. So it has to be, I have to be able to track it. I have to be able to track their value and reward them based on it. The cool thing is, is I have sponsored shooters that earn 10,000 rounds a month. Think about that. I didn't cut a single shooter when COVID happened and there was no ammo to be, sh- to be found. I added shooters and there were shooters in the middle of 2020 getting 10,000 rounds a month because they were great ambassadors. They're good influencers. They're whether they're a good shooter or they had really good sales and they promoted I'll gladly reward if I can see a win-win. So in most companies, I think a lot of companies need to take that strategy because it's not just the shooters fault on this. Um, a lot of companies getting into the industry because we deal with a lot of like small holster manufacturers and like startups in the gun business that sponsor events and stuff is, is how legitimate is their contract and how serious are they taking their shooters? It's bad on both ends to where, if a business doesn't take the shooter serious and what they provide the shooter, you can't expect the shooter to take the business serious. And that's kind of what I've tried to change with any companies that I help with contracting is like, no, you need to respect your shooter and give them all the tools to be successful. And if you do that, you're going to get a lot more out of them. If you just hope and assume in a year, you're going to be done with them and you're going to go through the next one. And then you look like this company that sponsors 800 shooters from C class to GM to whatever it is but that those shooters don't know the product. They don't know your mission. They don't know your core values. They don't know anything you're about. So what's the true gain from either party. So businesses need to fix it too. Not just the shooters in my opinion, or else they'll just keep getting burnt because that's what that, that's what happens. Oh, there we go. You need a cough button. Yeah, I know. Right. Just to hold it down and be like get Joe it. Rogan, just push the button and sneeze. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. No, thank you for going through that. And I think a lot of people needed to hear that both on the the shooter and the company side. Yeah. Well, it's not before we move on. I'm a testament to this as a sponsor shooter. Mm -hmm. It's not always what it's, if you do it right, it's great. But a lot of people, you'll see them get into the sponsorship thing. And if the businesses are putting requirements, then it's like, well, maybe this isn't what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like me, like I'll gladly wear a t-shirt or I'll be sponsored, but it, it, people have a false image because they see, you know, JJ or they see Max with SIG. Like what they don't see is how much work like Max puts in with SIG. They don't see how much work JJ puts in with Beretta and Arms Corps and like all these companies. Like it's not just, Hey, I'm going to come shoot and get free shit. Like it's a commitment and people have to have a reality check is like, well, if I'm going to get any value from this company, like real value guns and ammo and stuff, they're going to expect a lot in return. And do I want to do that? Because now this fun hobby sport becomes a job. And when it's a job, how does that affect your performance pressure and how it just makes it a snowball? So think about that too. (laughs) Is it worth it? Absolutely. And it's got to be worth it 
or worth your time, effort, and values, and whatever floats their boat. But um, Mike, if you had one piece of advice to pass on to anyone who's trying to run a business or start a business, what would that be? Um, find your purpose. Purpose to me, like on it. Well, there's two types. There's personal level. What is your purpose? And as a business, what is the purpose? We can relate that to like business core values and personal core values, which I just said a minute ago is core values. is like <clears throat> set your moral, whether it's your morals or standards of your mission as an individual and as a company and develop your purpose around that as an individual, be willing to evolve your purpose. So my purpose um, as a business consultant with companies is different as the president of a company is different, but I never lose track of my purpose. Um, in business, if you're an entrepreneur and you're doing, and you're working a hundred hours a week and it's easy to lose track, it's easy to get distracted and go off in another area and fail. Um, majority of businesses fail within their first five years. That's for a reason. And a lot of them just lose track of their purpose of what they're meant to be. They get distracted by the money. They get distracted by the struggle, by the failure, and they lose stuff. Establishing your purpose as an individual, but also as a company and holding to that value is probably the best beacon for guidance that I can give anybody. And if you're thinking of like starting a business and you don't know what that purpose of that business is or the purpose of yourself as a business owner, manager, whatever it may be, um, you're not going to be successful. And it sounds kind of deep explaining. I could go into the purpose side a little bit more, but it's really the binding glue when things get tough to remind you, like, here's this track of this purpose of this business. Like me, like my purpose now. So my purpose a year ago, like we'll just use Superbell as an example. So I own a business consulting firm. That's what brought me into Superbell. So I own a business consulting firm. So my business that business, my purpose is to build multi-million dollar companies. So when companies bring me in, my purpose, I'm not looking at, at it the same as if it was my company. I'm looking at it as like, how can I scale their company to the point they need to be? And then whether retain that some value or go to the next one. So the purpose is different. When it's a business like I own, my purpose now as a leader is like all 30 of those employees rely on me their kids rely on me. Like if I don't run my business right, they don't eat. So my purpose as a lead becomes more leader based. Um, if you have staff and it's a lot more than just, Hey, let's make some money. It's like, well, no, these are people's lives you're dealing with. These are people's lives that you're directing. And so your critical decision-making is extremely important. And we base that on the purpose. And I involve employees and staff with that too. Like it's very clear cut. Like I'm notorious, like in like we'll say Superville, where people come in and I'm like, this is the goal. And I'll put numbers up, like, we're gonna be a $10 million company by this date. Okay, now we've got there. This is a $20 million company by this date. This is what's gonna happen. We find the end goal and I structurally build it backwards of the steps that need to happen to get there. And we get there. And then I tell them that, and then I tell them what it's gonna take from them as individuals for us to get there. That's gonna happen whether you're on the boat or not. So if you don't want to be part of that, that's fine. I'll find someone who is. So that's the big thing is building your purpose, building your goal, structuring it in reverse. And that's like a little bit of the business consulting type stuff I do. Um, so if you're looking to start a business right now is a very a challenging time with, especially in manufacturing, just due to components and re restrictions in the gun industry with regulations, not to deter anybody, but um, I think that in the last 10 years, the media has glorified what an entrepreneur is and everyone thinks, oh, it's fast cars and money and have fun and make your own schedule. It's, it's the farthest from the truth. Only, what is it like out of everyone who says they're an entrepreneur, only 8% are entrepreneurs and only 1% of that 8% make seven figures. So if you think about that small of a number of, Hey, we're entrepreneurs, me as one of that 1%, I can tell you it's not the life for everybody. It's absolutely not if you are going to be that level of successful. Now, if you're an individual, it's like, hey, if I can make a couple hundred grand a year and enjoy it and have fun and that's where my plateau is and I just want to stabilize that, you'll get there, you'll have fun. And then someone, I don't say like me, but someone who's going above you is just going to crush you. Is Maybe they'll buy you out and you'll go live on the beach for a couple months or maybe they'll 
just dominate your business and put you in the ground. So it's really a, it's put sunshine and rainbows on starting business as an entrepreneur where people don't understand the struggle of it and the amount of time and energy that it truly takes. So I would hope that if anyone's looking to start a business and say it's like a part-time gig, okay, that's cool. But before someone going all in and risking everything, they really evaluate like what it truly takes to be successful, to be that 7% and get to being that 1%. Take it from someone who's done it multiple times. It's not easy. It's not typically fun. It's stress. It's miserable. Your hair falls out. <laughs> like it's so it's, it takes a different mentality and I wish our media didn't glorify it. I don't post like you won't see me on my social. I'm not posting like you'll see machine guns and, and fun shit, but like I don't get off on like the glory of the, of any money type things. Most of that stays in businesses to grow businesses, but with like TikTok and Instagram, you see all these 25 year old kids that got on Bitcoin driving Lambos. That's not success. That's not generational wealth. That's not an entrepreneur. Where's your warehouse? Where's your factory? How many employees do you hire? That's, that's business. So I just hope when people, especially in the gun industry, like there's so many like, Oh, I can start a holster company or I'm going to start a gear company. I'm going to start this. I'm like, okay, how big do you want this company to be? What's your realistic, realistic expectation? Let's do a market report on, what that company can really size to. Okay. This is what it's going to take for you to get there. And when you do that to most people, they go, Oh wait, maybe I don't want to do that because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not, it's not always that, that easy as unfortunately it's been made to seem. Mm -hmm. Well, and I don't know if you, I don't know how much time you have to watch media and uh, just for like an entertainment value, but I look at somebody like uh, Mr. Beast, right. Who doing all these crazy things on YouTube and whatnot. And, <laughs> just giving away a bunch of money. And it's like, this guy is like, he hit it big at some point. I don't remember his origin at all, but this guy is giving away money, make all this advertisement, all this crazy um, engagement with his content is, is crazy. It's yeah. Now what's the long-term value and what's, what's the, um, what happens when he gets hit by a bus? Oh, it all goes well, probably will all go away. Okay. So if you, when you think of that, because we have a lot of that right now, I call them entrepreneurs. We have a lot of instant overnight millionaires. We have a lot of the flash and shine. And that's where I say like, hey, what difference are you making in the world? Where's your place of business? Where's your product that you can show? Where's your factory? Mm -hmm. Wh whose lives have you impacted? Um, where's the long time stability and wealth for your family, your kids or generation on generation? Like, and where is that? And how controlled are you by the media, by YouTube? He could be demonetized. They could change the rules overnight and they're gone. So it's like, how diverse is your stuff? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want anyone to aspire to that because that's a very hard, like YouTube famous, Instagram famous, like that's cool and everything, but you don't control that. YouTube does. Mm -hmm. Instagram does. The liberals do. What right. do you control? You know, what, how vertically integrated are you? That's who I listen to. That's who mm -hmm. everyone should listen to. And like, you shouldn't envy um, individuals in that, in that situation, because oh, right. that's not long-term grind to build that. That's just like, I don't want to say luck, but it's dependent on like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and like that kind of stuff. You can become overnight. Well, what's the longevity of that? and mm -hmm. what lessons were learned right so it's something to think about maybe that's just me i'm kind of old school in that sense in business mm -hmm. um but well and just think about it someone some the new great hotness comes out and then you flatline you know because somebody does yeah know, just comes out of nowhere and <laughs> takes away your thunder well and when your uh, persona based businesses are great for marketing and branding to an extent but we're living a day and age where media the cancel culture, there's so much risk going on um, with everything is it could change, it could change overnight. Mm -hmm. And so to, to truly structurally build something correctly to withstand all the waves of society, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, but it's most likely going to weather the storm much more than, you know, the, the, you know, these people getting popular overnight because they're gone once the next big thing comes out. Mm 
Oh, absolutely. So. Now, I did get a couple listener questions. We covered a few of them through our organic talk, so I'm not going to hit those. But I think this one person um, was asking, your, any thoughts about offering Nine Major? And I think at SHOT Show, you actually released Nine Major. I teased it. Yeah, I teased it. It's not on the market yet. I'm waiting on the USPSA to get rid of Major Power Factor or to lower it to what it should be for Open Division. But mm-hmm. We can get into that if you want. Um, that's part of the holdup right now. A lot of it's component sourcing. There's one component that we should have had that got canceled, pushed further into back order. So we've got everything developed and ready, packaging. Everything's ready. It's just we're waiting on one thing. Aside from that, I was hoping the USPSA with nine major in the open division that they would reevaluate the power factor scale. And I get a lot of hate for that, but that's coming from someone who manufactures ammunition telling you that you're literally using a hand grenade to compete in a sport. And there's a massive amount of liability. So there's a reason you don't see federal Winchester, Remington, CCI, any of them make nine major. It's not a Sammy cartridge. It's not a, they're in liability insurance. Good luck getting coverage for something that you're clearly violating what it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Now, shoot or shoot that, they could shoot 38 super comp, but what did the report 60% this year at national shot nine major? So it, yeah, it was it was a landslide apparently to yeah. uh so I don't I know it's been proposed uh to the board of directors. I've been in talks with them. I provided all the data. I have a full ballistic lab um at our facility for pressure testing, so I can tell you the internal pressure of a cartridge. And nine major is like 57,000 PSI on average. And the maximum allowable pressure on a nine millimeter casing is 38,500. Mm-hmm. So guys to compete in the sport are risking a lot, which is fine if they want to take that on. But on they have to understand companies like myself, that's a huge liability that we have to navigate um, product liability. They don't want it. Most of them don't want anything to do with it or have to pay such an excessive premium. Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping the sport realizes that effect and we've presented it to maybe they will people have hate on me. They can send it and I'll explain both sides of it, but we'll see what happens. If, if they don't in time, we will release it, but there's going to be a lot of stipulation on it Mm -hmm. getting out there because open division is difficult because every gun um, you look at certain brands, they'll chrono like 180. So when you build, like when I do a 40 load, when we develop the load for the 40, I can narrow it pretty good. Same thing with nine minor majority of the guns, five inch, we can get power factor, but in open, you got guys with two port, three port comps, but two poppies, three poppies, one poppy hole, like that all is going to mess with velocity. So a load in an Atlas with two poppy holes, you might come in at, 125 grain projectile at 1360, whatever you'll be like 170, 171 power factor. And then you put it into an Akai or one of the infinities with four or five. Now you're not hitting major. So it's like, as a manufacturer, we can get into certified match ammo if you want. I don't know if you got questions on that, but to develop a load to hit the market, most of them are putting it even, are going to put it even hotter. So that way all the guns will hit major with it. Well, now you're just beating the shit out of guns. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes into making, uh, for open guns because there's such variety in open guns and how they need the ammo loaded and for tuning. And it's a, it's a headache. I'm not against taking it on and we have started the process, but it's, it's going to be very dialed and it's going to be very specific um, on it. I'll probably be one of the only ones that will literally have the chrono data for every, for Atlas infinity for every model of as many open guns as I can test for transparency. So guys actually get what they're supposed to, you know, they know what they're buying. But mm-hmm. Now, as an ammo manufacturer, what is your recommendations for major then for like nine, ma- for nine major? You mean power factor? Yes. Power factor. To stay within Sammy specifications, which is the fucking the governing board of ammunition. It's 150 power factor. Okay. So if you go buy ammunition off the shelf, let's just say federal HST 124, it, chron- it power factors about 149. So I would make power factor 145 because shooters are going to go five over. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we're going to load it to 150 within 150 power factor. I've tested every major manufacturer's hottest plus PMO that are members of SAMI that are liability insurance will cover. And the hottest you're going to find 
a plus PMO is 150 power factor. And that stays based on the pressure testing at 38,500 PSI. What that does is means you can shoot open division without buying three guns. You're going to get double the life out of it. You're not going to be worrying about blowing shit up all the time. Um, other companies can participate in the division because then they would make an open gun because they're part of Sammy as well or trying to adhere to that legal side of it. So like SIG and Glock and whoever else wanted to, they could technically, now it's not going to be as competitive as a 2011, but it allows them. Plus as a shooter, you could go buy ammo off the shelf. Federal, mm -hmm. their Syntec, I guarantee they would have a nine major load. Superball would have a nine major load because it adheres and we can legally cover it with our liability. Um, now, a lot of people are going to hate that side of, of that thought process. But on the business thing, that's what makes sense. I get the point of power factor. I wouldn't change limited division. I wouldn't change single stack or L10 because the 40 caliber can easily make major power factor. The 45 can easily make power factor. But you got to realize when, when power factor first came about, what was everyone shooting? 45s. 45, which can easily make power factor. Now, statistically, we can show you that nine millimeter controls everything. So why are we expecting the nine millimeter to perform at a pressure that was designed around 45, mm -hmm. right? On the practical side of the sport, it's practical, right? So defensive, right? They're at 145 power factor. That's your standard plus P ammunition. So there's a lot of I get both sides of it. I'll always argue that one as a business person and based on how power factor came about and the way the sport's going and some open shooters are like, Oh, that's stupid. We want to race, but dude, the division would grow. Um, people would be safer. More ammo companies would participate. The cost would go down tremendously. A lot of these ammo companies are charging so much for nine major purely because they got to get coverage somewhere. It's not costing them. I'll tell you right now, the cost is not much different than nine minor to mm -hmm. manufacture, but they're taking a huge risk because someone's going to blow up a gun and it might not be their ammo's fault. It might be, they put that nine major in a gun that wasn't built correctly. Right. So there's a lot, there's a lot of risk on both sides and um, to it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's sometimes it's just not worth it. Like you said, the, you know, your liability insurance is, it's already high enough as it is and you don't want to risk it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and it's, I don't know. I don't know how much I think it would be good for the division for the sport, but I'm the, I'm also the type of guy and we'll just get a little wild here. Why is if there's to me, there should either be major points in every division or none. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is carry optics? It's origin is carry, right? Right. Your carry pistol. What do you carry? Do you carry 147 grain, 130 power factor, nine mil, or do you carry plus P defensive ammunition? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, why wouldn't you allow major points and carry optics? Why wouldn't you allow it in production? So to me, if, if you're going to have major points, every division should be allowed to have it. It shouldn't be round base. I mean, I'm, I like IPSC. I like the box capacity, but I'm a little bit crazy to some people on that talk of it, but mm -hmm. I mean, that's what those division origins were meant to be. It's called carry optics, right? So mm -hmm. I think that, um, but they wouldn't be able to hit. The problem is the power factor. You can't, you're not going to have a carry optics, like shoot a SIG 320 and hit 170 power factor. If they put it to where it's still within legal, where it should be, then these other divisions could have minor major as well. And they could choose to lose two or three rounds, but get major points or, they could have the extra capacity and shoot minor points. That sounds pretty cool. I mean, mm -hmm. I got dudes, I'd shoot production with like a damn Glock 21, shoot 45 or something, you know, who, who knows? Yeah. And I honestly, yeah, I was, I was honestly thinking about that the other day of adding major to like carry optics and um, production, because why not? Cause there are people who carry with 40 or 45. Yeah. And why is the capacity limit? Like the 10 round thing, keep that in L10 and production a production gun, if I can buy a stock Glock 19 and get, what are they, what are they 15, 17 rounds? Like, mm -hmm. that's a production gun. I mean, that's why I like the Ipsic box thing. Ipsic, I think it's 15, but, like, it's meant to be a gun. You can go buy a production-produced gun and shoot it as it was produced. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. 
I've got a lot on that, but I think the USPSA, they've made enough gear changes in the last year that they need to leave it alone for a while. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I and agree I think too. The power factor thing's getting shot down. I'm sure it will be purely because the board is like getting ripped so hard over the last year and a half because of all the gear changes that even if there is something good proposed, they're just going to be like, no, now's not the time. People hate us enough. We're not going to make any changes. We need to let things settle down, which I don't, I don't disagree with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We need to, I do like that. They added the co- changing of competition rules in the new bylaws. I do like that. It has to, it won't go into effect for a couple months after. Yeah. After no, getting that's reviewed. The way it was. That's what it was supposed to be. I think that was like the only good thing. There was one other thing of the bylaws. (laughs) In my opinion. That's just my opinion. Right. Yeah. And that's all we can ask for. Um, But you were talking a little bit about certified match ammo. Um, I don't know what that is other than people submit ammo to be certified. I don't know if if you want to go down that rabbit hole with me. (laughs) I mean, I'll gladly talk about it. I haven't made my stance on it. The USPSA has requested me multiple times to certify our ammo because they see everyone shooting it. Certified match ammo, basically what it is, is a company is allowed to submit their ammunition, which is going to be tested by the USPSA to make sure it makes that power factor that's advertised. Once they certify it, you as a shooter can purchase that ammunition and you're basically exempt from chrono. So if you go to a nationals and you're shooting a certified match ammo, you still have to chrono due to the bylaw. Every shooter must chrono. It doesn't say every shooter must pass chrono. So basically what happens is that shooter shows up certified match. I don't know, like federal Centec was one of the, probably the most popular. They show up with that ammo. They go chrono. If they fail chrono, that's fine. As long as they're within 10 power factor of the sample ammo that was provided 10 power factor, which is huge, mm-hmm. then they still get points. So you'll have shooters that shoot open and will shoot a nine major through a four poppy hold infinity and chrono at 155 and get major points for it. Does that seem right? I don't think so, but that's certified ammo. It basically just the supports allowing companies to um, send their ammo to be certified on a customer base. I get asked all the time by customers, Hey, can you do this? Because they want that peace of mind of, Hey, I can go to a match and no matter what I chrono, at, I'm going to pass and maintain my points. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of, I'm kind of old school. What is, I mean, their founding letters will say is DVC, accuracy, power, speed. What is power? Power factor. So no one, in my opinion, should be exempt. I'm still mentally going back and forth this on a business sense, but on a moral sense and a competitive equity sense, no shooter should be exempt from chronograph, in my honest opinion. Um We'll see how that goes. If things will change, maybe Super Bowl will certify their ammo. I still have yet to reply to the USPSA, and maybe they'll hear this podcast, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around the purpose of certified match ammo. It would be like, let's put it like this. Let's say um, Solomon or, no, let's say a gun. So let's say Atlas. Atlas is a certified match gun. And if you shoot Atlas... Accuracy, power, speed, chronograph, that's power, accuracy. Okay, so if you shoot an Atlas pistol, all your Charlies are now alphas. <laughs> Think of it like that, right? right? Mm-hmm. Speed. Okay, so if you wear Solomon shoes, the official shoe of the USPSA, if you wear Solomon shoes, we're going to take two seconds off your time. Okay, now let's apply that to power. If you shoot blah, 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 certified match ammo whether you're 10 power factor under it doesn't matter because you shot that certified ammo so now you get those points the whole point of the sport on a competitive level is those three elements so we're coming here to compete and part of having your gear in line and passing chrono that's a huge part of it to award and earn those points so that's as a competitor what kind of where i have a hard i don't think people look at it like that of like it's one of the three elements of the origin of the sport in my eyes. Now, other people say power, like explosive power. Well, that wasn't the intention of DVC accuracy, power, speed. Um, but that's an IPSC, old school, me, whatever. I've only been in sport for three, four years, and I'm saying that right now. Like, I don't, I don't like the aspect. And I'm a company that is per, per approached by the sport to say, hey, this is a great business opportunity for you. And for me, as a business individual, 
like the business side says, Hey, that's huge promotion. That's free advertising. That's more sales. That's more of this. And I'm the one saying, no, 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 this isn't right to begin with. Like it's not, here's another reason it's wrong. What about all the shooters that reload 80% of the sport? Are they able to go get their stuff certified? Mm -hmm. So that's an unfair advantage to them. What if they can't afford to buy that high price certified match ammo? They have to go and compete with their reloads, but they have to pass chrono. So why does the individual who can afford this high priced certified ammo get exempt from chrono? Right. Like that to me, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of elements. Talk about like a business tort, look up business tort. What is that? It's an unfair advantage given to a business. So the companies that are going through the match certified now, they have an unfair advantage over their competitors. The other business is trying to compete. Mm-hmm. All right. So me, it's like in business, like I let my product speak for itself. And I, what I said, 20 million rounds of our 147 competition load. Now it's not all been competition shooters, but in the past, since the past two years, we'll say I've not had a single shooter fail chrono. I've not had a single shooter have a major match malfunction with my ammo. That to me, like if you want to guarantee, there's a guarantee. Like look at the quality and the ones that are actually performing. And as a shooter, you have to, that's part of the sport is Mm -hmm. passing the chronograph is passing. That's like saying, Hey, if you use a blade tech holster, when you come to chrono, even if your holster's three inches hanging out off the side, you're fine because you're using a certified match holster, even though it violates your division. If you shoot in single stack and, well, I guess we can't say that because they move the magazine. But you get what I'm saying. It's part of the rules. So why should a company and someone have an exemption of a rule? Mm-hmm. But that's probably a perspective most people aren't shoot thinking. They're just thinking, Mike, why don't you get your match ammo certified? And I'm not saying I'm 100% not going to do it, but I need a better explanation of the USPSA, how it goes. It goes against their own bylaws is my, my point. It mm-hmm. goes against the origin of the organization is my point. And unless they can explain it to me, then it's like, why? Mm-hmm. I'll just keep selling. It's not going to change how much ammo I sell. It's not going to change how many national titles are won with my ammo. It's not going to change any of that. All it's going to continue to do is give other companies a little, little bit of free marketing and advertising to have people come fail chrono, but then get major points. But mm-hmm. as shooters, we know that because we see it, we shoot with it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to buy? You know, it's, but that's certified match ammo. Sorry if I ranted on that one. Cause I, it's, it's been going, I've been dealing with it for the last few months pretty aggressively. And it's kind of like, I don't know. I, I don't wish know. I like the old school side of things and I like competitive equity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Competitive yeah. equity is big for all who really care about the sport. And honestly, mm-hmm. if, a, if, a, and you may, if an uh, ammo manufacturer cannot be consistent enough to keep ammo above minor power factor, at least like you shouldn't yeah. be making ammo in my opinion. Well, so the hard one I I have is the um, with like open division. So the major ammo, because there's so many, like we discussed in open guns, I can develop a load that hits ma- a nine major load or 38 super comp. Now, some dude's going to go take his homemade custom home built, you know, four and a quarter inch stroke with four poppy holes, and he's not going to hit major. Right. Mm-hmm. So like if I want to certify nine major or 38 super comp, comp and the open division that's extremely difficult because there's so many variances in open guns and variance in velocities purely based on how the gun is built and limited most like 95 percent of shooters that are shooting 40 are shooting a five inch gun mm-hmm. i set my my load like with the artemis is a four six right it hits power factor five inch you might be one or two power factor above the minor guns like majority of shooters shooting minor like you can shoot a Glock 19 and hit power factor with our ammo. You can hit a Glock 34. So it's like that simple. But the open division is what really the hard on that I have is because I see it. I've shot. I literally, I won't name the company. I compete in Cali all the time. And it was a week before nationals. And I was shooting with a shooter. And he had a gun that had five poppy holes. And he was literally shooting and hitting so low because the velocity difference because of all the gas bleed off. We chrono and he chronoed at 152 power factor and it was certified match ammo. And his decision was, do I go shoot nationals and get awarded major points? And we resprung his gun and it was like shooting minor through an open gun, which is 
damn near huge competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Now, as him, similar to me, very big on competitive equity, he goes, yeah, this ammo, like I can buy it and go have a guarantee, but that's not right. Like, what am I truly winning by doing this? Like I'm going against competitors. I'm earning major points, but I'm basically shooting minor ammo and springing this gun, which has like no recoil. It's like shooting a 22. How is that fair? How is that competitive equity? It's not, but not all shooters are, are like that. So the nine major and 30 super comp and certified match ammo is kind of a, they should get rid of that. And maybe I would consider it just due to how many variances, or if people are failing with it, they should be constantly reassessing it as an ammo manufacturer. I mean, we can do everything we can to make loads and like all of our minor ammo and all of our major ammo. No one's ever filled Corona with it. We haven't gotten into nine major yet though. And I'm sure when we do, you know, I might make 170 power factor through an Atlas and maybe it's 165 through something else. It's hard to, it's really hard to know because mm -hmm. there's variables in that. Oh yeah. And I, I totally understand where you're coming on that one because you never know. Not every gun is set up the same. It's not like, it's not like they're saying an open gun has to have only two pop of holes with three port comp or something like that. You know? Yeah. There's no guidelines on that tour. And the, so you'll see like Atlanta there. I love their ammo and they had, like <laughs> they're nine major. Some shooters like, oh, this is really hot. And then we have other shooters like, oh, this is perfect. Well, the guys that are feeling it, it's hot, they've got two poppy holes. The guy that it feels perfect is four, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to load their ammo for to make power factor with the the low-hanging fruit, like the whoever has the most. So it's gassed up to hit power factor. But if you're a dude that's shooting, you know, with only one or two poppies, it's going to come across as hot, but that's what they have to do to ensure their ammo hits power factor, mm -hmm. which sucks because when you're shooting nine major, that's just that much more pressure. But how do you certify that as the sport? Like there's mm -hmm. too many variables, you know, and I don't know. I'm, I have a gripe with the whole thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just, just don't shoot chronographs. Okay. Shoot yeah, I know. I mean, that's, <laughs> I think at area one, they shot two or three of them. Oh my God. Why do you keep shooting them? Throw that Tight. stage out. <laughs> yeah. Just uh just don't uh get your, use your certified match ammo and shoot the chronograph, I guess. Like there you go. Works for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I I don't know. I complain and voice my opinion pretty openly on all this stuff, but I don't know. I try to provide a different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. but I am the one like I'll speak on it, but I'll physically be there at the event telling that individual to their face like hey this isn't right this is why that here's my opinion but i want feedback like maybe i'm missing something maybe there's something but from the shooters especially the top like serious like mgm or shooters that aren't just like hobbyists most of them you'll hear them uh, competitive equity is a big deal to them mm -hmm. and when you ask those guys they're like yeah that's stupid like when i gave that explanation i just did to you they're like yeah you're right that is kind of dumb but they're not the ones, they're the ones hand loading because they want that perfect load, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's an educational type thing. And maybe the USPSA didn't 100% think it out the way that I'm explaining it. I don't know. And maybe I'm just griping and it's not as big a deal. It is to me because I make ammo. But to everyone else, it's probably not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Hey, but we all need to hear it. And I, I never heard about it like that before. And it's kind of eye-opening, to be honest with you. But Well, think of it like this. If you're shooting against someone who's getting, if you're in a, open or limited or whatever and you're in a division and you go because i've watched this happen and you're shooting against a guy who has certified ammo and fails chrono but is still awarded major points and you're competing against him how's that affecting standings because we know there's a big difference in major and minor mm -hmm. and if i can get major points shooting minor like you reference nils go change mm -hmm. nils as points at nationals to major and see what happens oh yeah he blows them out of the water okay he's shooting a minor gun so when i have there's plenty of shooters that are getting major points mm -hmm. that might be hitting minor power factor, but it's certified match ammo. So that's where it affects you directly is like, who are you competing with and how fair is that standings that on that day, that chronograph, that gun, that scale, that ammo has to hit major. That's the <laughs> way it was supposed to be. Why are we changing? It? Exactly. I, I agree with you on that. That's for sure. Now, we're getting near the end of the show, Mike, but I do have a couple more questions for you. Um, I know you said Supervel is sponsoring a bunch of matches this year. Um, what are some matches that um, you're kind of looking forward to going with uh, Supervel for? Um, 
the biggest one's probably going to be Dragon's Cup. Um, that's honestly the best match I ever shot was Magnus. Second best shot was Dragon's. I think Dragon's may this year will probably be better than Magnus Cup. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to Dragon's Cup. Uh, the Roadrunner shootout next month in Clovis. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Area One, which is up in Nampa, Idaho. They did a really good job in 2020. And when I talk about like I sponsor what I believe in, like I didn't sponsor area one this year and I'm glad I didn't because it was a shit show and I'll never sponsor. I remember MDs and I remember RMs and I will tell you that. And that's how I sponsor matches. Mm-hmm. And I area one, they did an amazing job in 2020. They picked it up randomly and had, it was a really good match. And it's the same crew doing it this year. So we're sponsoring area one area two, which is always an amazing match. We're going to sponsor area two plus a bunch of other little ones, but me as like a shooter, the ones that I'm most excited, um, I would say dragon's cup, uh, berries, red rock rumble. Um, we're doing berry steel open. We're doing a lot of them, but dragon's cup for sure. Last year I shot it and I shot with staff and it was a grind because we shot the whole thing in one day and I had to reshoot a bunch of stages and it was a long day, but that match from top to bottom was amazing. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, and then infinity open when that's announced and goes out, we'll be involved in that. Um, very excited for that one as well. There's a lot of cool stuff. I'm not going to say too much about it, but everyone needs to keep an eye out for that. That'll also be in Texas. Um, I like, I don't know. I like these oddball matches. Like I like private, I consider dragon's cup, like a private, like Marco Davis, like that's a private, not a private match as in you can't come, but the USPSA doesn't have its hands in it. It's like, mm-hmm. Hey, we're hosting. This is hosting this match. It's a specialty match. We'll just say, and those for some reason seem to be the best ones. So take that for what it is. Oh, absolutely. And those are, it's, it's nice to see what Marco's doing. Um, for sure. I mean, he kind of got out there. No one really knew kind of what dragon's cup was other than the like few select people. And it, it, it's become very popular. I think that thing sold out in less than two hours when it opened. Yeah, and it was, I mean, dude, last year, the, the part where I realized, like, I think it was on the second or third day, I was there for, like, five or six days, but I was sitting with Brian Connolly. He had his, he has his Hunter's HD trailer, and we have our demo bay at the very last bay with Atlas and all the Super Bowl ammo and people over there shooting, and we're sitting there, and it's like a dust storm came through. Mm-hmm. That's the only match I've ever been at where like everyone was so happy to be there, like shitty conditions. It got super windy and everyone was having like the time of their lives because the staff was extremely friendly. The stages were amazing. The sponsorship involvement was sensational. The, I mean, the food, it was like more like an event, like it wasn't. And so like a shit condition was overlooked. I mean, they had, they had auto, they had people resetting, stages they brought in the youth and paid the youth to help reset stages like the whole thing was like a win so once that word got out and people saw the stages and saw the whole thing that's why it sold out this year is because and this year billy billy dodson and mark i mean they're doing even bigger this year like it's going to be even better so it's sweet i think we'll get more of those so like infinity open i think there's going to be more of that kind of stuff happening um in the next few years and it'd be cool to be um, see those pop up and see them grow their reputation of selling out and being good top tier matches. Yeah, another big match this year. I don't. I'm not going to be able to make it to it because schedule conflict. The one match, and I didn't ask this question. The one match that I can't make that I wish I could would be Area Three, um, just because Matt is a new Area Three director. He's a great shooter. He's involved a lot of top shooters on developing his stages, designing his stages. It's not. I've shot Area Three before when with Sherwin where it's like a circus. Um, It's going to be a three, two, one format match. I think it's going to be 15, 12 or 15 stages. It's still on grand islands. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make it unless something changes, but based on what I've heard, that one is one. Like if I was anyone looking for like an air, a level three match to go to, that would be another top one um, that I'm sad that I'm not going to be going to. Mm-hmm. yeah i was i maybe one of these days i'll be able to make it out to area three myself but it's just not in the cards for myself but um 
It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. In the middle of Nebraska. It's in corn right? country, man. I mean, like, dude, there's not there's not much to do. Like, it's. <sighs> I mean, well, you could do shooting, and then after shooting, go get drunk with your friends and go, go make be a bunch of hell cows. <laughs> yeah. They have a belt bowling alley, a pretty sweet bowling alley and pool hall. We'd spent most of our time in there, but there's not much to do to mm-hmm. do there. Exactly. Yeah. But Mike, I know you said you lo- dropped all your sponsorships for the year, but is there any companies you do want to plug though, that you support, even though you're not uh, affiliated with any companies? Yeah. I mean, the I'm very selective on the gear that I run and I like to, obviously I'm going to run what I feel is best. But also, I like to work with companies that I feel are great individuals, Um, whether it's a business relationship, a sponsorship. But this year, there's no sponsorship. So really, there's no a lot of people think, oh, you're a sponsor. You have to say those things. So now it gives me a chance to be like, no, no, no. I truly feel this way. There's no strings attached. This is what it is. Um, Atlas for me will always like they'll always be that way. I've been close with them for a number of years. I feel they make the best pistol for the open division and limited division and that's what i'll shoot and they've always taken great care of me and we've always made it a win-win and even though i'm not officially sponsored by them anymore i'm going to continue uh, to utilize their guns let people borrow my guns try my guns and promote them when i have the time to promote them unofficially um another big one aside well obviously super Bowl, um another company priority one holsters chad like I'm about the people too. I'm about the products and about the people. And Chad's a great dude. Um, he makes a great holster. I think I've been using his holsters since 2018 when I very first started. And he's a solid individual. I like to work with with solid individuals. Um, so I'll continue. I mean, that's one. Um, Hunter's HD Gold. Um, I have no. I've never had any affiliation with Hunter's HD. I just really enjoy Brian as a person. He's had me on his podcast twice. He's a great individual. He gives back like so much to the sport. Um, I love that dude. He's really great. And we share a lot of common stuff, just like in business and our personalities. And he makes an amazing product that serves a purpose. So like I'll, I'll run his, I'll wear his hunters. I need to try the new frames. Hopefully this year I'll, I'll order up some of those and try the new frames because they look pretty slick, but. Um, he is one for sure. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's others, there's others that I'm missing, but you can pretty much see that the stuff I talk about and the stuff I wear that I rep, like it's for a reason and it's, it's because it's a great product and it's got great people behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's why, that's why I use those products. Absolutely. And you know, if we can stand behind the people, they stand behind us too, even though they might not be official right yeah yeah the whole official thing yeah it's not always you can do a lot for companies and they'll do a lot for you it doesn't always have to be a a contract thing Mm -hmm. it's about you know giving back it's just like thanking ros and staff like you gotta think as someone who is a sponsoring events like it's nice to um like when, when we donate a bunch of ammo and I get an email, Hey, thank you so much for supporting this match. Like that's it for me. It's like to know that that donation made a difference, kept someone shooting or like when Brian's putting his glasses on the table, when he hears someone, Hey, these glasses are amazing. Thank you so much. I need a new eye pro. I'm sure that makes him feel amazing. So like, I wish shooters would look around, thank the sponsors, thank the staff. I don't, anytime we sponsor, you're losing money typically i mean Mm -hmm. we make some we lose some same thing with like staff like staff they're not getting paid to do this you know and i wish people would take more appreciation shooters would take more appreciation of the staff um especially lately with all the rumblings in uspsa and all the hatred not hatred but negative stuff that's going on with like ro's like it would make it hard to ro right now like when you hear so much hate and people going after like crappy scoring and they're volunteers. Like that that would be a big, you know, shout out like to those dudes. Like there's some OGs that I see at every single major match. Like the, probably the one that comes to mind is, is uh, Yemen, Yemen Lin. Mm -hmm. Like he was at the very first major I shot. And he, I think I've seen him 
as a CRO, an RO, whatever it may be, at almost every single major match. And he's not getting paid to do that. That's just commitment to the sport. So, like, the guys that are doing that, like, that's what keeps the sport going, and we got to thank them and quit shitting on them. Like, be a part of the solution, not the problem. You know, I always, all the time, I'm saying, like, dude, where's your tip jar? Like, like <laughs> I would pay, I would pay 10 times as much in membership fees and pay more in match fees for those guys to get paid. And so we can have quality because there is some poop, you know, in the staffing, <laughs> but mm-hmm. they're still volunteers. So, right. Yeah. And yeah, everyone should go out and think they're ROs. But Mike, where can they get a, where can they find you on, on the internet if they uh, so want to? Um, social media. I mean, Instagram. You can find me on Instagram. It's just Mike D. Stoker. Letter D, that's my middle name. Someone took my actual name and I haven't fought for it yet. So it's just Mike, the letter D, at Mike D. Stoker. Same thing on Facebook. I don't get on Facebook too much because I'm I'm not 70 um, <laughs> for the boomers. But I'll po- cross post on Facebook and engage occasionally. Um, through Superbell stuff too, you'll see me on that social. You can always engage there. Emailing is probably, the, if it's a business-based inquiry, um, emailing reaching out through Superbell is probably um the best one and then i have a youtube channel but that's kind of i don't do too much on there so i can be found in a number of places <laughs> just be patient i'll do my best to respond if you ask me a dumb question i will either tell you you are dumb or i just won't respond to you <laughs> like, not to be too blunt but that's the truth mm-hmm. that it is and like, I want to thank you again, Mike, for coming on the show. It's been a blast. It's been fun. Um, I've learned a lot. Hopefully the listeners have learned a lot. So I want to thank you for your time. I know, you know, you're a very busy man and time is money. So I, I thank you for your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. I do have to do it again. Oh, absolutely, Mike. We'll bring you back on. But to the listeners, thank you for checking out another episode of Manny Talk Shooting. Until next time, get out and do the things, and I'll see you on the next one.